Well, hello. What's going on, Paul? How are you? What's happening? You no, know, that music got me going for sure. It did. That, yeah, I was really excited right, about it. Right, I, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the vibe <laughs> now. I love the vibe. Well, welcome in everybody to another stream here with ZBrush 2023 and Redshift. My name is Ian Robinson, and I am a ZBrush trainer here at Maxon on the ZBrush team. And I am joined by Paul Gabry, who I don't really think you need an introduction. Most people know who I'm you are. I'm the assistant. You're the insist assistant today. I love it. Yeah. Perfect. Well, today <clears throat> we're going to be covering Redshift rendering and ZBrush, uh, but also, too, we're going to be covering a little bit of um, some tips on how I use ZBrush to achieve uh, when I go for a clay render. So, you know, if you guys have any questions, but uh, I was going to do a little bit of pointing out of like some uh, nice features like thick skin, maybe some of the new features like apply, uh, apply last action. So we have a lot of stuff coming in today as well. Um, so if you guys have questions again, feel free to ask and we will go ahead and we will answer them to the best of our ability, like always. But I really wanted to showcase the, the render that we're going to be going for today. Um, we will be sharing the ZPR at some point, so we'll be um, sending out a link for that. Uh, it will usually be in the description of this video. So if you would like to follow along, um, then you can download the project and you can try it out for yourself. So that being said, we can't see your comments. So let's let's get into just the basic overview. Um, and yeah, Redshift, it's going to be fun. So first things first, I'm using ZBrush 2023, which released last week. And here is my model. I'm using this uh, fighter model that I built. And we're going to go ahead and just do a quick render uh, just to kind of showcase what it looks like when you are rendering. Uh, but we're going to break down the how to get started, kind of build the scene up from scratch. So again, um, you'll have project to follow along with that. But seeing everybody here, yes, Nacho is going to be doing a stream. Yep, absolutely. Woohoo! Yeah, the skeleton I'm behind you, I'm Paul. I'm in the chat the link for the reminder right now. So there's yes. a link so you can go and actually be reminded for Nacho's stream. Yes. We're doing a five-part series. You probably should tell them that, right? We should. We should. Tell yeah, yeah. Part series. Yep. So we are doing five weeks. So this basically every Wednesday for the next five weeks, starting with this, we are going to be doing five part series where I'm doing clay rendering today. Then we have uh, a Mr. Shane Olson, as some of you might know, for the 3D character workshop, going to be joining us to showcase how he uses Redshift with the stylized characters. And then we are going to have Paul Gabry coming in with Hard Surface for all you Hard Surface gurus out there. And then we'll have Mike Thompson coming in with character design and how he uses Redshift with that. And then we'll have Nacho for jewelry. He's going to be coming in and showcasing how he uses uh, Redshift and ZBrush with uh, his jewelry renders. So lots of really, really cool stuff. And that starts now, this Wednesday, and every Wednesday, same time, same bat channel. So it's 11 a.m. to noon. We're going to be covering a bunch of stuff. Um, today, I'm going to kind of rebuild. We're going to start with like Redshift from the beginning, like how you would you how would you activate it? How you would load an HDR? Where you could find HDRs without scouring the internet? Things like that. I'm going to cover. So we'll try to rebuild this to the best of our ability. Um, rendering takes time, so you know we'll try to kind of cut out the, the 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 messing and nitpicking on little things. But ideally, just to kind of showcase what it is. And for those of you who might be curious or asking yourself, why would I use render? Uh, with Redshift and ZBrush. Um, one of the things that I've really discovered in my uh, playing around with it is the fact that you get to just render your sculpt straight in ZBrush. And I'm sure some of us know 50, 60 million polys can be kind of an interesting adventure to come on out and try to render. So being able to render and get um, some nice samples, even portfolio shots, even just kind of getting the idea of what my character or my project would look like, it's so much easier it's so much more beneficial to kind of see that process early on, especially if you're like me who are likes to do test renders in the beginning. This is a great way to get a lot of that information early on so you don't have to keep bouncing files back and forth. So there's a lot of benefits to it. And so seriously, we're going to go ahead and start getting in. Unless, Paul, you wanted to add anything before we get started? Uh, the only big thing, too, is um, we're also going to be looking at all the other features as we go through these streams, a lot of them, too. <clears throat> so um, feel free to ask any questions. I'll be here to funnel questions to Ian um, where we can as much as we can throughout the stream as well. Um, and then the big thing also to understand is if you do want to render with Redshift inside of ZBrush, make sure those are two separate installations. Redshift is its own program, right? Yes. So you got to go through the Maxon app and make sure you render ZBrush I mean, you install ZBrush 2023, and you also install Redshift. 
it's got to have that on there. Yep, 100%. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm just going to kind of start from scratch and do a breakdown. So I'm going to open up a default project and this is where if you're following along this will come in really handy. Um, and following along again, we'll be sending out assets. So when you watch this in the, in the future, you can go back through it. But I'm going to go ahead and say load tools from project. And I have my project right here. And I'm going to go ahead and open that up. And that's going to bring in my sculpt that I was working on. And one of the things I like to do when it comes to rendering is also, too, I do like to establish a viewport um, size so that I know that I'm working with a size that I would like to end up with when rendering. So if you're doing something for, let's say, Instagram, or you're doing something for a portfolio, those might be two different sizes. So what I like to call out is if you go up to document and come down here to the uh, width and height, you can actually set this to be something like, let's say, 1920 by 1080. And I do this a lot, just again, just to kind of set my scene. And then if I hit resize, it's just going to say, do you want to do that? Say, yep. And then you'll hit Control or Command N if you're on Mac. Or, and then we're going to redrag that out and hit T for edit. And now my scene is now resized. Now it might be a little hard to see. So I can use the zoom sliders to kind of reframe that to my scene. And you can also hit actual and that will give you kind of the border. So you can just adjust that. And again, I like to do this when I'm rendering because once I, I have two different mindsets. I go from like sculpting and designing, and then I switch over to rendering. So I, I view things a little bit different. So I set my final document size from there under the document window. So that's how you would approach that. So now clay rendering. So clay rendering, if we're going to open up the materials, this is where we're really going to be focusing in the beginning is I want to have a clay based material to start with. And it's it gets no simpler than this. When you open up your materials, just like you would in any other ZBrush project, you'll notice down here at the bottom, we have two new menus. We have the Redshift Polypaint Materials, and we have Redshift Preset Color Materials. Now, the Polypaint Materials will respect the polypaint that is on your model. So if you use one of these materials, then it's going to see the polypaint that you have, and it's going to go ahead and try to um, respect that as much as possible, keeping it there. So the material will change, but you'll see all the colors. So for example, if I were to just turn my character to red and I'm going to go ahead and make sure my character selected. Now, the new way about doing this, especially if you want to apply this um, or use this new feature, apply last action to all subtools. If I had multiple subtools, so I'm going to go ahead and just in, append and insert a couple more real quick and then just put them out here in the ether. So if I were to want to make sure everything was example, let's say green, I would select my main tool and then I would pick that kind of greenish color. And then I would come down on the under the tool menu. We're going to go under poly paint and say fill color with making sure that our RGB is selected, of course. And then I'm going to say fill color. Now that's going to fill my main model with green. And now to apply that last action, I just come up to the subtool menu and then I say apply last action to all subtools. And this will do all visible subtools. Now, if I had a folder, let's say like these two here, so I'm gonna quickly group this one and this one into a folder and say, yep, that's in a folder and say test folder, yay. Now, let's say I wanted to adjust just these two with a different color, so maybe a hot pink, because why not? Then what I could do is the same process, go under the tool menu, and then I can go to, again, poly paints, fill color, and then under the subtool menu with the uh, folder, I hit the cogwheel, and at the very top, it says apply last action. And then it's only going to apply to the subtools within the folder. So those are two ways you can use that new feature. I'm using it a lot for colors and materials, but you can use it for pretty much any undoable action that you can think of. So definitely play with that. It's a really cool feature. I'm going to go ahead and just delete this folder for right now. And we're just going to work with this one guy here. Now, I'm not going to stick with green because I feel like that's a little... <laughs> That might be a little Why? Weird. Why? Why not? Well, I don't know. I want, I want something a little bit more clay like. What what uh, what we would Hulk green. Let's see. Hulk green. <laughs> yeah. I want something that everybody can see. So let's pick a color that maybe would be a little bit more popular with the uh, material. And I'm just gonna do the basic uh, color and color fill object. 
just because I'm dealing with the one subtool. And so now when you first start Red, uh, ZBrush, Redshift is turned off by default. So if you try to just do a basic render, then Redshift would actually kick to BPR. Now I had it on, so let me let this kick through and then I'll, I'll re-demonstrate that one second. But yeah, usually by default, so I'm gonna set this. By default, Redshift will be turned off. So if you hit Shift R, you will see you get a normal BPR render just like this. Now to turn on Redshift, I'm gonna take the render menu and I'm gonna click and drag this icon off to the left-hand side. You would open up Redshift Renderer under the render menu and you'll see the Redshift button here is turned off by default. And like Paul had said, mentioned earlier, Redshift is a, a separate subscription unless you have the Max on one. So when you have, once it's installed, you go to click this on. When it is turned on, Redshift is now activated, and we are using Redshift uh, from this point forward. What's really cool, and I do want to point this out because you can combine renders now. You can use the BPR render, and you can use the Redshift render. So if any point in time, let's say I want to enhance my ambient occlusion uh, pass, and I really like the settings I get with BPR, I can just come back in with Redshift render, turn off Redshift, and then come through and adjust my BPR AO, maybe turn this on under our render properties, and then start adjusting the BPR AO to the way I would usually do it by rendering BPR. And then I can save out all of those passes. And then I can do my Redshift render, save off those passes, and start combining um, either with a BPR filter system or in another application. So there's a lot of versatility here, too. So if you were used to doing Redshift, I mean, BPR renders in the past, you know, that, that process is still alive and kicking. And you could definitely combine the two. And I've been having a lot of fun doing that. So just another way to approach rendering. But going back into it, if I just turn on the Redshift render, now Redshift is activated. And I can hit Shift R to do a full render, or my favorite now is render region. So hitting Control or Command if you're on Mac and R together, hovering over a specific spot, let's say his fist, I'm gonna hit uh, Control R. That's gonna do a render region. And what's really neat is it's just gonna take a small section of what it is I'm going for, and then it's gonna showcase the actual render itself. So this is really neat if you're trying to kind of see what your render is going to look like without actually having to re-render the whole scene every single time. Now, I'm going to go ahead and make sure, let's fill this with a flat material. And I'm going to go ahead and just say material only. And I'm going to go ahead and just fill that because I want to start from scratch and I had that material baked on. So I went ahead and just filled it with a flat, and that's going to remove all the material presets. So now I can switch between all these different materials that I've used before. And before we go too much further, I would like to mention that Redshift will also respect matte cap materials and standard materials in the render. So if there's something that you've custom built or downloaded that you really like, Redshift will recognize those materials as well. So you can use a lot of materials. You don't have to just stick with Redshift. Very cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's pick a Redshift material and we're gonna pick clay because clay is fun. And we're just gonna do a render region to kind of showcase what the clay looks like right now. And then I'll show you some settings and stuff like that go through. And again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to jump on out there and scream it because we'll listen. Perfect. Okay, do, 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 do. Any questions so far, Paul? All right. Doop, doop, doop. Actually, Paul, I think you're muted. I can't hear you. All right, let me unmute myself because I don't want to thing. So let <laughs> me uh, answer the question that came through from Buttons the Monkey. Right now, the uh, which is another great name. You guys are really good with names. I swear you guys come up with some awesome names for your... So anyways, the Redshift materials can only be used in ZBrush um, at this time uh, because the way that... Redshift is being integrated with ZBrush. It's not going to necessarily be able to be taken that material yet out and plopped in Cinema 4D or any other DTC that you're using, whether it be Maya or Blender or Houdini or they were using Redshift. So it's just for ZBrush. But with that said, there is ways to, in essence, create mad caps that you could bring into Cinema 4D. So you could render a sphere with the material in ZBrush and then use that as a mad cap in Cinema 4D. Um, but it's right. That could be a way 
of getting that out. But no, to your question, you can't just take the Redshift material and ZBrush and put it in Cinema or vice versa right now. Correct. All right. So we have our base render now. So what I would like to do is go over some of the basic settings too, just in case anybody here is looking for the first time and is just not sure what some of these settings mean. So if we look at Redshift Render here on the left-hand side, we will have a use default panorama that's on by default. That is going to give you a base HDR lighting that you can see your model with and you can go ahead and start to render. You can always turn this off and bring in your own HDRs and get that HDR lighting specifically for your render. But this one is turned on by default so that you can actually see what you're rendering and get some good results quickly. Underneath that, you have render quality. Now, progressive rendering is usually turned on by default and it's set to 64 progressive iterations. You can adjust this to however you would like. The lower will be faster, you know, okay uh, quality, and then higher will be um, high quality, but it would take a little bit longer to render. So uh, 64 seems to be like the nice little sweet spot where you can do a, uh, a quick, simple render, but it's going to just slowly give you a render um, with its progressive algorithm, and then turning it off switches from progressive rendering to bucket rendering. So um, I like bucket rendering. Uh, when I'm sampling, I usually kick on progressive rendering and stay with that just to get an idea. But for the most part, I'll switch to progressive rendering, especially for my final renderings. Underneath that, we have our primary global illumination engine. It's a primary quality and then a secondary. These are set to what we believe is like really good settings out the gate. You can always adjust these if you would like, but I really like the setting qualities that are set to three and two, but you can always play around with that, of course. And then the quality preview in ZBrush and the preview size is how ZBrush viewport is going to see that render. Um, so you could uh, so you could go through and just kind of get a, a nice little look. If you adjust these higher, your preview will get better, but it's not going to give you a true final render um, like you would if you were to just render it. Um, again, I don't usually mess with these too much, but it's nice to know that I can adjust that if I would like to see a higher quality in my preview. And then we have our depth of field, which allows us to apply a quick depth of field and a focal point and how big of a fall off we're going to get. And then underneath that is the Redshift Baker 360. We won't get into this today, but if anybody has any questions on the settings, I can go ahead and answer that as well. But that's just an overall view. And then underneath, if you have dynamic subdivisions turned on, array mesh or nano mesh you're using, and you would like to disable those at any point in time in the render, you can just click one of these and that will go ahead and disable the array mesh. Unclicking it will leave the array mesh ability on. So that's the main render one. And then we have the floor material up above. So here, if I wanted to, this is tied to our floor button. If I wanted to apply a floor material, let's say something that like a shadow catcher, or I built a custom shadow catcher that has like a nice uh, shiny floor to it. So I can actually apply the material directly to the floor. And now if I go ahead and render that floor with render region, we can start to see those reflections. And we can build that too. It's just taking the floor material and then applying a metalness and a little bit of glossy uh, adjustments to that as well. So now that we have a base starting point, let's actually introduce HDRs. And that can be found under the light menu. Now I'm going to dock this on the right-hand side just so that we can see our, our render settings and I'm going to see my light settings. And if we want to just start with an HDR lighting and make sure that we get something that we like, what I do is I take this top light and I don't turn it off. I actually turn it down to 0 0.001. This is almost off, but still allows me to see the materials that are inside. So if you do turn this light off and you pop into materials, you're like, hey, where do my materials go? It's still there. It's just ZBrush needs a light source to kind of rec to see the previews. So I just keep it really low and that allows me to still see my materials. So if you run into that, that's just set it to 0 0.001 and that's a good way to still see your materials and have almost no light information. I'm gonna turn off the use default panorama and I'm going to go again under the light menu, go to background and now I have this texture. And here I can import the HDRs that maybe I have uh, loaded in from previous downloads, that stuff I've used in other applications. And we now um, not only look at HDR files, but we also look at EXR files. So I could come through and import something that I really like, or what I can do is I could open up the light box 
And then under texture, there is a panorama folder, which is the first folder. I'm going to double click that. And then it's going to start lo uh, loading the default um, images that we had here previously, and then some EXR. So I can actually select maybe this one and then double click it. And that will auto populate that into that background menu. So I can either import my own or I can go ahead and double click one of those and bring it straight in. So, right, so ZBrush is shipping with some HDRs that you can use out the gate, which is nice. And then from here, this the HDR is tied to, pers uh, to our uh, perspective distortion. So if I turn this off, I'm going to get a little bit of a flat color, which would be really cool if you just want like a nice, simple uh, flat color from your HDR. If I turn it on, it will actually bring that HDR background in. And then if I go to my draw size and I adjust the actual focal length, let's say 18, I can start getting more of that HDR or less. I can zoom in further. So I can adjust how the HDR is being seen. I personally don't use uh, the HDR backgrounds as default. Um, a lot of times I'll blur them out or I'll just use a flat color, um, which what we, or what we can do is actually just hide the background altogether by turning the on button off. And now it's going to use that HDR on uh, lighting, but without the background. So if I were to render this now, so let's render region as space, it's gonna yep. come on and it's going to just use the lighting from the HDR. Yeah, that's important. That's an update to ZBrush. The fact when you load an EXR, when you change your focal length of your camera, it's going to update based upon that camera angle now. So that is yeah. something that is new to 2023 that he just showed. Yep. And I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's super cool. And now I'm going to, so if you want to edit your HDR, notice it's a little dark right now. And I want to be able to see more of this. So I can go back to the background and turn this on. And now we can get some edit features happening. So the gamma set to 2.2, which is what we think is the best default gamma for all HDRs when we load them in. It sees it correctly, but you can adjust that at any point. On in the time. window side. That's key. On the on window the, side. On the Mac side, it's going to be different. OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have exposure set to 1, which is the overall exposure of the HDR. And then underneath that, we have the redshift exposure. And what's the the really defining uh, distinction between the two is the exposure, again, will do the overall um, HDR lighting. So that affects your model and that affects the background of your scene. But the HDR redshift exposure affects how your model sees the light. So I could turn down the exposure to say something like 0.1, but then I can increase my redshift exposure to let's say 3.5. And now if I were to do a render, I could start seeing a balance between the uh, how my model sees the light and how the overall scene sees the light. So you can really start to play with this. Now that's pretty dark and exaggerated, but let's say I want to do like a 0.5 exposure and then leave it at 3.5, come in and sample render region and get a sense of how my model sees it. Of course, I don't use just HDR lighting um, to light my entire scene. I do use some of the other default lights that we'll uh, set up here in a second, but it's I like to work with one light source at a time. And now I can start seeing my model a little bit with a nice little rim behind him. So this is already looking pretty good. I'm actually just gonna go ahead and kick up the base exposure just a little bit more and get a sample again. Perfect. So you can start seeing how you can just quickly come in and start adjusting. Once you like something, I can go ahead and actually turn the uh, background from on to off. And again, that's going to render the scene with just the uh, model and no HDR background. Before I do that, I would like to point out we have a few more options there, which some of you might be familiar with, which is longitude, latitude, tilt, and blur. So what's cool about this is that, you know, not every HDR is built the same and the lighting information can change. So I can actually adjust the longitude and latitude and even the tilt and then do a test render. And that's going to adjust how the HDR lighting is affecting my model. So if you want to mess with those settings and dial in exactly where the HDR lighting is coming from, you can mess with those sliders or you can click if you know exactly like I really like this set at 000. So you can go in and type those and then that gives you that response. And then the blur just blurs your background. 
But again, it's really neat because you can get some really cool effects with this. And again, it will just blur the background. Then when you hit render, you'll see a blurred background on top with your model there. So just a nice way to keep the background if you like the colors that you're seeing, but you don't want the imagery behind it. And then last but not least is the uh, rotate with object. By default, when I'm moving around, it is set to rotate with my object. So as I rotate the camera around, the object in the HDR is going to move. But let's say I really, really like that background. So I'm going to uncheck rotate with object. And now I can go ahead and rotate my scene. And the HDR stays true to where it's at. So you can go ahead and kind of play with what you uh, what you like and get different results and stuff like that. So, And then, of course, I can always change this back to how I would like. So completely up to you how you would like to play around with that, but just really a lot more control, uh, which I really, really love. Nice. Checking chat here for a second. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So now let's we're going to cover a, just some of the material settings, but of course, too, um, there's questions. Feel free to throw it in there. Um, yeah, they, they're asking for you to show the slime bridge in this stream as well. So. Oh yeah. In fact, I can. I will happily show that right now. Slime bridge is really really cool. So let's actually here. Let's come down here. Let me just open up this guy. And what I'm going to do? Let me hide my HDR real fast, and I'll showcase slime bridge. So let's go with a standard material or a basic material, and I'm going to kick that lighting back up to 0.85, which is or ZBrush default. Yes, Slime Bridge is really awesome. So with Slime Bridge, what I can do is this feature requires to have multiple objects within the same sub tool. So for example, if I wanted to bridge a sphere with another uh, with another uh, sphere, I'm going to go ahead and Control Duplicate this, and let's actually bring this up here, and then I'm going to clear that. And so with Slime Bridge, it's actually looking at the mass and then bridging those two together which is the simplest way to talk about it. So I'm going to create a mask right here by pressing Control or Command and painting a mask here. And then I'm going to paint a mask over here to connect these two together. And then I'm going to come on down to Slime Bridge, which is under the tool menu. It's its own menu, so you can open that up. And then now you can adjust either your tension, bridges, branches, or capillaries. So I'm actually going to... I wanted to say capillaries because I know I know it's like oh, you're going Louis route, huh? <laughs> like for a second, I was like, Capillary. like I thought it for a minute, and that's a slime bridge, and now it's going to connect those two uh, tools together. And what's really neat is turning on the wireframe. Now I can say, you know what? I really loved this guy right here. I like those. I can also go to poly groups, auto groups, and isolate these just a bit further. So I could say like, yeah, I really, really like this one I want to take from there. So you can come through and start uh, grabbing, picking and choosing the ones that you really, really want, especially if you're going for something like drool or saliva. Um, what is also neat, though, is that I'm going to paint one mask. And I'm going to go back up the slime bridge. And I'm going to loosen up the tension. I'm going to drop the branches and the capillaries. And I just want a few bridges. And I'm going to go ahead, and now I can start getting some loops. This is really cool. I've gotten some really neat loops this way when I wanted to make like an ornament. I've actually played with this. And it's like, hey, there you go. So a nice way to create some really cool stuff. And again, you could just need one by itself, one mask by itself, or, or two masks to go ahead and make that work. If I throw the tension all the way up, it's going to really stretch that so you can get a lot more effects which is fun. This is this is such a cool feature. I love it a lot. Yeah, I know. And you you threw in dynamics when you were playing with this too, which is yeah. a great. Uh, someone brought up uh, Sculptures Pro and using it with this as well. Yeah, and then don't forget about dynamic brushes being able to manipulate this too. Yeah, perfect. So that's Slime Bridge. And yeah, I, I really love it. And yeah, so it, it combines well with a lot of things. Um, yeah, I use dynamic like Paul was saying because... It's just kind of neat to see what you what effects you can get. All right. So now, did that answer the question someone was asking about Slime Bridge? Is that did you have any specific questions about Slime Bridge? Yeah, definitely. Do, do, do. So, 
you know, the streams. <laughs> also, it's tailored for roots and vines. Absolutely. Yeah. The, what's really neat is we really want to see, too, what how everybody uses it. I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of uh, symbiote-style <laughs> sculpts. But I've used it for saliva. I've used it for the ability to just quickly connect two things together that I wanted to have. Like You could take it down to like one, one bridge and tension, and then connect something a lot faster. So there are a lot of really interesting ways to utilize it. So at, at, at its base core, it seems like pretty simple and straightforward, but then to be able to kind of grab the stuff that you want and be able to manipulate the mesh further with other ZBrush tools is going to be super helpful. So definitely give it a shot. All right. Yeah, saliva so far. Perfect, yeah. Um, all right, let's move back to the Redshift render if that answers that question. So I'm going to go back and pick clay now for rendering them or for editing the materials themselves you could usually render uh, i'm sorry you can usually edit any material under the material uh, menu under modifiers and redshift materials and zbrush is no different so i'm actually going to go ahead and open up the material menu and dock that to my left hand side and now i'm going to open up the modifiers tab and you might notice that there is a different list altogether than let's say something like a mat cat if we look at the mat cat menu there are you know a few different things like cavity intensity monochromatic depth etc but with redshift you get a different menu so going back to the clay you can see here that we start off with some diffuse weight and some diffuse roughness and then we move into metalness. Now, what I like about this menu is that things are grouped together that make sense. So when you're looking at this list, looking at metalness and then reflect color, roughness, IOR, um, and et cetera, it's actually everything that reflects, you know, is together, is grouped together. So metal would obviously have some sort of base reflection, and then you can work on top of that. And then we move into refracting. So we have the refract weight and the roughness, IOR, samples, that's all grouped together. So when you're looking at these materials, if I were to come to subsurface scatter, which is right down the list, you'll see that everything that affects subsurface scattering is grouped together. And so it makes editing these materials a lot easier because you can come through and turn on the things that you want and leave the rest alone. For example, if you see refract weight or sheen weight or coat weight, that's turning on that ability. Right now I have coat weight turned on to one. If I turn coat weight down to zero and then do a render, it's actually going to kill the coat weight altogether and just not have it on. So you'll be able, even if you have coat roughness and coat IOR, it's now it's no longer affecting the material because the weight, the coat weight was actually turned off. So that's a quick way where it's like, I just don't want that effect on, but I don't want to change my settings. That's a way you could quickly turn that on and off. And you can also, of course, it has a decimal setting, so you can set it halfway, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, we have sheen weight, same thing. If the weight is some zero, then the rest of that is also turned off. So you don't have to worry about turning every slider down to zero that says sheen. Just turn the weight off, and that will do that as well. Um, at the very bottom, it might be a little hard to see just because they are they are uh, all white, but we do have some color swatches that also affect the material. So we have our base color. So if I wanted this material to respect a, a different color altogether, let's say, well, let's go back to that hot pink. I can actually you know find that color here in my swatch like I normally would, then drag and uh, pick that color. And now if I were to let's say do white overall. He's not filled, but then I were to do a render, this material is now going to respect that base color. So this is a way you can adjust the color of your material as well. And you can start combining your poly paint colors with your base colors if you're using the poly paint redshift material. But if you want just to completely use only the material color and have no poly paint um, come through, then you just, this bottom slider just above the swatches says use material uh, color, just turn that to one, and then it's going to just default to your base color at that moment. And you can turn that back off too. So you can switch between the two. So depending on what you want to build, you can actually play with these settings. I usually leave this at white unless I know I want a specific color for universal with that material. Um, you also have reflect and refract, sheen and coat and emissive. 
for your uh, for coloring and getting a different effect with those materials and those effects. And then you have subsurface scatter front and subsurface scatter back. These colors combined overall gives you the 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 color that's going to be pushing through with your subsurface scattering. And of course, we're going to be covering more of that in these types of uh, live streams in the next few weeks. So we're going to be diving more in depth with that. But I just like to point them out today. So if you're already playing with those materials, then you could start adjusting and saying like, oh, you know, for example, if I wanted subsurface scatter here, I would turn on this, do a little bit of pink, maybe a little bit of a deeper red, and then turn that subsurface scatter on amount. And then that's going to start pushing through the subsurface scatter material. So just calling those colors out so you know. I'll set them back to zero for now. There you go. And then now, so just focusing on the clay, I like my clay to be a little a little shiny. Um, I had a little, a little bit of a sheen to it. So I am actually, you know what, for this tutorial, let's actually give it a base color. Um, unless, nope, that's already filled. And here's the thing too, I can actually come in and pick that base color from my poly paint. So if I had poly paint like I do here on, I can actually pick that if I wanted to have that color use, but my object's already filled, so never mind. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start adjusting some simple sliders. So the clay material that ships with ZBrush is pretty good out the gate. So now I, if I want just a little bit of, of shininess to it, I'm actually gonna take the, ref, uh, the reflect roughness. I'm just gonna dial that down. And for demonstrations, I'm actually gonna dial that way, way down. And then let's get a full render just to kind of see what the effect that we're getting. And this will combine now my HDR is turned on and now I'm playing with my materials. And I also have a main light turned on as well. So we can start dialing in. We got global illumination that just kicked in. So this is, if this is the first time you're seeing a redshift render, you can actually see how like the global illumination kicks on first and then it starts finding the, the space and then rendering it out. And there you go. That's that's already kind of a shiny clayish material. And I just picked the default clay and then I turned on the defuse. Or, or sorry, the um, not the defuse. Yeah, the, the the reflect roughness. Jeez, I'm all over the place, Paul. What's wrong with me? <laughs> you're muted again. <laughs> I know it happens. I'm typing, I'm typing over here, so I'm doing one, I'm near. Um, <clears throat> as far as documentation goes, I shared a link. Um, you guys remember, this is Redshift, right, that he's playing with. These settings that are in ZBrush, most of these settings that he's playing with are Redshift settings. So the documentation I just put in, that's what they're doing, those sliders. They're calling Redshift and making the changes um, yep. to the material. Also, a key point here is you also can have that material on your model and still sculpt with it and then 100%. do also still the render. Right. So that documentation is there. And we've got more stuff on uh, working that we're all working together, put together for you all as well. So there's definitely a lot more coming down the pipeline from us to help you establish your renders with Redshift if you want to use it with inside of ZBrush. <laughs> yes. I also just shared a link to to an IOR list I've been using a lot. Um, it's just a website you can go to and it actually tells you the materials and the values that you can work within to get that value there. So if you're coming through and you absolutely need something like coral, I'm working with coral, then this tells me that my min value for coral is going to be, where was it? I lost it, uh, 1.486. And where I would make that adjustment is inside of my material where it would say IOR. So here my reflect or my refract weight, I would actually start adjusting that. So I'd say like, okay, that's 1.486, I think I, that's what I said. And then that updates my material to that effect. So if I were to re-render this and let's actually do that to my, um, to my reflect as well, here we go. And then I'm going to do it to my coat weight as well. And that's everything that is active with the IOR. So now if I were to go ahead and re-render this, now it's going to take a look at that value and it will change the material and give you the results that you're looking for. So it's a great way to get something close. Um, some of these changes are minimal, but then some of them like diamonds and crystals and glasses would have a much higher value. So definitely play around with this and take a look this helps guide me to like glass right here is 2.040 so that's that's a different value but you would take this information and then you would work with it so i shared that link in the chat as well so definitely play with those settings as you're working through the material 
And I just want to note too, before we go too far into it, if you find something that you really like, you're spending this time building material, just like any other uh, ZBrush material before it, you can come through and save this out and then say, yeah, this is, this is my clay material. This is what I do. Boom, done. And now if I want to load that up, what you can do is, of course, I like to just pick a material that I don't usually default on. I say like, yep, I'm going to go ahead and just load that in. And then I find my clay material and then I bring this back in and that loads in a, another material. You can also to do a basic material, for example, and you can copy that material settings and then you can paste it to another material that maybe you don't use, but you would like to uh, paste that in. And then that gives you another way to play with materials. So you can start loading in materials, save them out. And you can also maybe, you know, um, kind of, experiment a little bit, play with materials, um, but you have these nice default settings to work with so that it's all, um, quick, fast, and simple so that you're not spending a ton of time trying to reinvent the wheel. We have some nice basic ones there for you. Perfect. Uh, so it's the roughness amount of material. For the IOR, for, yeah, so the IOR would affect any of the, um, IORs that are within the material. So for example, if that IOR is calling out 1.486, I would change that to all my active IORs. So I would change that to my reflect, my, my refract, and my coat as an example. And that way, all of those IOR um, uh, settings are exactly the same. So if you see this number in here, you're just taking that number and then you're placing it on all your active IOR channels inside the materials which again is under material and then modifier with that material selected. Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. So yeah, um, where are we at? Wonderful. Now here's what's really, really cool. So let's actually move this back. Let's see, let me pick my clay material and I'm gonna set the IOR back to 1.5. In fact, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and just look real quick Make sure maybe we can adjust that. So let's see. Do, 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 do. If I wanted a chalky material, 1.50. So perfect. Yeah, 1.5 is perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and just set those values back because that's what I'm utilizing. And then from here too, I like a little bit of uh, sheen to my clay. Um, so I'm going to just increase the sheen a little bit. Not too much, but what I do like to do, and I'm going to call out a new feature that is uh, really beneficial to when you're doing renders in ZBrush Redshift, is that, in fact, I'm just going to kick the sheen weight all the way up, and I'm going to go ahead and hit render. And the feature I'm going to be calling out is render recall. Now, render recall is super cool because what it does is it remembers your camera position and your material settings and light settings at the time of render. So for example, a lot of us will spend time trying to render out and get something that looks really good. And what I've noticed I do is I'm like, you know what, I wanna see what it looks like with full metal. And then I'll render that out. And then I'll be like, ah, that's too much. I'm gonna dial it back. And then I'm gonna kick it up again. And then I'm gonna dial it back. Well, that back and forth, you're gonna, you're gonna start to forget what settings you had when you really like something. Instead of, and so instead of trying to chase down the exact settings that we happen to find, what we can do now is under the render menu, go to render recall. And there is a slider and a button here. And I can actually come through and start going and looking at every render that I was playing with. And you could see here, it's remembering that camera position. And let's say this was the render that I fell in love with a while back. So um, that's, that's from 23 to 10. What I can do now is select 10 and say, this is the render. I'm going to hit re-render. And what it will do is it will re-render my scene and then tack it on to the next render. So this will be render 24. So it doesn't wipe out or forget all the renders previous, but it just comes back and allows me to have all my material settings go back, my lighting the way it was. Um, the only thing it won't do is if you come here and say like, okay, I rendered this guy this way and then I moved him over here, then I moved him back. It's not gonna remember your geometry position. It will remember the position of your camera though. So if I adjust this and say render region here and let that group in and render. And then once it does this render, 
I'll then turn around and do another render somewhere else and it will remember where my camera was facing. And it does remember render regions. So if I come back here and say this spot here, and then I'm gonna render this, I can now go back through and say, you know what, I really like this angle. This was the coolest angle. And then I can go ahead and re-render that. So there are ways you could play around with this. And it's a really cool feature. Um, I would also like to point out too, that I've been using this a lot, which has been in ZBrush for a while, but going to draw and storing your camera, this works with perspective. This is the best way I tend to come in and start setting me like that's the front angle. And then maybe this is the side angle. So I'll store those. And now too, I can come through and flip between it. So I don't have to chase angles. I recommend doing this instead, but it's nice to know that render region is there, or render recall is there for you to always go through that. So, all right, all right. Also, hello, AQ, see you in the chat. Welcome, welcome. Perfect. Right. Well, one item that just came up. So if you are gonna use a missive to light your scene, which is awesome, a great way I do that myself, Right now, there is no way to hide the object um, to not be there in the final render, but still emit the light. A hundred percent. Yep. However, that being said, that actually leads me to something really, really cool, which is if we go back to our light box here at the top, we actually have a Redshift demo test here that comes default with ZBrush. So what you could do, instead of loading in your characters and building materials based on your character and trying to do that sort of stuff, what you can do is come up here to the top, double click this. I'm gonna go ahead and just say, no, let's not save that. And what we provided was a Redshift object and an infinite background that comes with ZBrush now. And so what you can do is come in here, turn on Redshift, and you can actually start playing with your different materials. And let's say, for example, I want to load in my clay material because I want to see what that look like. I can now come through. And this is a good example. I have a bunch of subtools here. So I'm actually going to hide my infinite background. I'm going to pick one of, the, uh, one of the portions of this whole thing. And now I'm going to say, OK, I want to make sure I apply this to my uh, to my objects. So I'm going to go back and again, I'm going to go with poly paint under the tool menu and I'm going to say fill color and then back to sub tools. And I'm going to say apply last action, all sub tools. And notice that the infinite background is not currently visible to ZBrush viewport. So when I say, okay, everything that was visible is what got the material, but my infinite background here still has this very shiny, uh, plastic. So now I can come through and I can start building materials here. So you don't always have to start with the project you have. And what's really neat is you can also bring in your project uh, tools from here. So you can load in your, your Excel or you can load in uh, your tools from a project the same way I started this. And then you can come through and do a bunch of test renders and see what you like, say what you want, and then start bringing those projects in. Or you can use this, um, this uh, template to actually do some really cool renders and have an infinite background and then bring in HDRs and not worry if the HDR is visible. So there's a lot of really neat ways to go about uh, doing this. So you could play with a bunch of stuff on that. Yeah, super handy starting point, right? Perfect. Yeah, the camera saving is under draw. Um, and so, yeah, you just come up here under draw and then you can come through and you could save a bunch of them. You can delete a bunch um, or you can delete one at a time saying the front one I didn't like, the back one I didn't like, et cetera. So say, so yeah, I'm going to delete all that because yes, no good. Uh, real quick, I'm, I'm not completely understanding with one person that you're asking the W Abdelatif. You're at, um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Are you asking to share this on our LinkedIn or something? I'm not sure because you were asking about sharing it. This is this is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch this as much as you want on our YouTube channel, and then you'll be able to share that link with anybody. Um, and this is just the first stream of a five-part series that we're going to do and take a look at the new features of ZBrush 2023, along with showing you different ways to render with Redshift. So I'm not 100% sure if you were asking permission to share it or you were asking for something else so and it we there are no node based inside of zbrush so there is there is no node editor inside of zbrush so right now they're 
there is no way to node the materials themselves. Yep. And to answer another question, the save camera is handy. Does it work with the timeline? Yes, it works with the timeline. You can open up the timeline the same way that you've been playing with it, add your points, and then you can switch between your points. Yep. Can you delete the render recall history? Sorry for swamping the chat. Oh, um, I do not believe you can delete them, but you can save up to, it's over 50. How many can we save in total? Do you remember? 100. You 100. Can 100. You save 100. It'll, just, it'll start replacing. It'll start going back. So no, you can't delete within the line anywhere. Um, it's just going to over override. So if you get to 100, it goes back to 1. It starts overriding. Yeah. I don't think I've gotten to 100 yet, but probably. I have I've gotten, never even noticed. I've gotten to 60-something before. I'll tell you why I probably never get to 100. Because when I start playing with rendering, I go, Oh, this looks good. And I start playing. No, this looks bad. No, this looks real bad. No, this looks worse. And now we're gonna going probably backwards a lot. So I actually really like that feature a lot because I think every render that I personally have done with this, I've used that and gone backwards instead of going where I was, honestly. Yeah. And that's what I love about that uh, that recall. Get down, recall. I just had to do it once. I just had to do it once. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. Uh, when I start rendering, I usually know what I want, so I get in there and I I save a bunch of stuff, and then I'm like, "Ooh, let me try this one thing." And then I try too many times; it's broken. It looks horrible, especially that like I come back the next day and I'm like, "What did I do? This looks horrible." <laughs> so then it's nice to know that that's there while I'm playing. I can kind of compare where I was and where I'm going and understand that I can back up in time. So that's uh, that's definitely handy for me. The other thing I wanted to showcase too, since I'm trying to make sure that I cover all the basics of Redshift and how you guys can get started making your renders right now, is there is a Redshift property under Subtool for each Subtool. So if I go under Subtool and I have a selected Subtool, and I come down to the bottom under extract is now Redshift properties. And then you open that up and that's a smooth surface, which is on by default. And what this will do is you might notice here, let me see if I can get a, a darker, <clears throat> more, let's see, let's, let's get a darker color. This is a, this is pretty, uh, this is pretty purple. So it might be a little hard to see. So let's say, let's, do you think red might be good? Let's try red. So I'm going to go through here, grab the RGB, and I'm going to uh, fill. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to just hide this guy right here. Let's actually group everything together just to make our lives easier. So instead of hiding everything, let's do what I did before. I'm actually going to pick this part here. And then let's actually group these all in a color. So I'm going to hide that one, Control F or Command F, and say that this is my test object. So now I have this, so I don't have to keep hiding and then I'm going to come through here and say, fill that color with red, come up to this little cogwheel and say, apply last action. Again, just really making it simple. But what you might be able to see if I turn on the wireframe is that I got a lot of faceting happening. But when I make a render, it's actually going to smooth that down a little bit and give me a little bit more of a smoother surface. Now, the, if I didn't want that feature on, I can actually turn that off and then get that effect. So if I turn this off, smooth surface, and then do apply last action to everything. Now when I do a render, let's see if we can see it, you'll actually see that faceting within the object. So the smooth the smooth surface is going to essentially just give you a smoother look without actually having to subdivide up all the time. Now you might still see the points of what your geometry is. So if you have nice sharp points like here, you would still see that within the render a bit under smooth surface because it's just smoothing the overall. But it's a nice way to kind of just add just a little bit more and still work with low uh, low polygon objects without having to worry about subdivide, subdivide, subdivide. So you could just go ahead and do that. And this also works with, with uh, dynamic subdivisions. So you can, again, turn on dynamic subdivisions like you would before and then render with that. And so smooth surface just adds on another layer to maybe kick down the faceting a little bit more. But as you can see here, I start to get that faceting. And then if I turn the smooth surface back on, say apply to all, say perfect. Now I'm going to go ahead and re-render that. Now that's going to give me a smoother look to my object. So just a nice way to kind of go through and not have to worry about it. And you might be able to see a couple of the points of the actual geometry, but overall it does a really good job smoothing things down so that it looks 
nice and, and clean, which is what I like the most. Perfect, perfect. Doop, doop, doop. So as you see too, well, again, a lot of the benefits of rendering Redshift with ZBrush 2 is the fact that we're able to get really fast renders. And I like to point out that I'm live streaming while doing this because I've tried this before um, on my own personal channel and it's I get robotic and I get kind of crazy. It's like, rah, 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 rah. so here it's like nice to be able to render, play around and still be heard. Hopefully I'm coming through cleanly. <laughs> if not, you could tell me. <laughs> But it's really, really nice. So that was the other feature, too, within Redshift Properties. And again, that's also able to do the apply last action on top of it. Awesome, awesome. OK, great, great. Let's see, go through. Um, it doesn't, uh, no, right now, ZBrush does not support node materials at this time. Do, 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 do. Just want to make sure I'm hitting all the questions. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, great. Let's see here. So again, um, one of the things we'll point out too, which I really, really like, again, you're able to combine your light settings. So you can still come up here and use a lot of these lights and bring in other different lights as well. So I can start tacking on like the 0.85. So if we go back to, let me go back to my original scene right here. There we go. And again, I like to start off by maybe setting this. So I'll come through here and say, you know, let me get a, let me get my new document, draw this out, say, yep. And then I got to reframe my scene and then I'm going to do my render. I'll do a render region. I can now start playing with some of these other light uh, or light tools up here in order to now get some different effects. And again, then we can also bring in some other objects if we wanted to plane to add some emissive. So I got the first render, so I can come through and say, let me change this light source over here. Maybe tack on another light source, get a little crazy. Say distance of 90, perfect. And then, yeah, that might be a little bit bright, but it might be good for demonstration purposes. Come through here and then re-render. So you could start tacking on those as well. So again, the point of the stream was to definitely give a, a starting point for everyone to come through and start rendering and having a place in which you know you can actually confidently get in and start making those materials. And again, I like the the kind of grayish clay look, especially for toys or just just trying to show my model off quickly. It's a really great way to do that. So, and then the last thing I wanted to showcase, well, there's tons of stuff I want to showcase, but one of the things, the big mentions I want to cover um, is BPR filters and also um, adjustments. So under render, if you come down to the bottom of the render menu, we have this adjustment menu. And this is really cool because this, this actually updates you live as you're working. So let's say I like this render, but I kind of want to crush a few things. So I'm going to turn on adjustments and now I can start playing with my contrast. I can either kick it really far up or obviously really far down. So I can start pushing some of these and edit the look of my render. So let's say I'm going to push a little bit of this in this direction, and then maybe tone the brightness down just a little bit, especially on the red and the greens. And then my gamma, and eh, my gammas, I'm gonna actually crush my gamma around. So just let's say I really, really like this. Now, when I go ahead and do a re-render, which at any point in time, if you just hit escape, that, that shuts off the render. Now, if I were to go back and hit render, what you'll see is the redshift render will kick on and then the adjustments will happen afterwards. And for me, this is a really good non-destructive way of working, especially when you're trying to color correct or just tweak something to see what you like, because you can always turn the adjustments off or you can actually say, I want to clear it and start over all together. So you see that the, the render happens and then the adjustment happens afterwards. And I can turn this off or I can turn this on. So again, just a really nice way to go through and start playing around with those adjustments. And then if I wanted to, earlier we talked about like maybe getting a few BPR passes that I really, really liked. So if I wanted to go under Redshift Render and maybe turn the Redshift off altogether, and then I want to do a BPR fill, uh, render and use some of those passes in conjunction with Redshift, then what I will do is um, under the render, let's actually move to my BPR shadow. And the things I usually like to hit is like 24 rays by 35 at like 0.6 with 
G strength and 0.8 with F strength as like a starting base. And then I'm going to do a VPR render. Now I'm going to start seeing some of those like deeper shadows that I really, really like. And then I'm also going to maybe with AO, if I turn that on, so come into my render properties, turn on my AO, and then maybe adjust some of my BPR AO. We'll get too crazy with this, but we'll do something like that. And then I'm going to re-render this. Now what I can do, which is really cool, is I can take some of these, and then uh, now I can come under my render my render passes, and I'm going to save out my sh the shadow path that I like. I'm going to save out my shaded pass that I really like. Say, sure, all that's really good. Yep, and I'll save my AO out. Perfect. And then, yeah, sure, why not? I'll save the floor. Maybe I'll composite that later. Now what I can do is I can come back in. I'm going to turn Redshift back on. And then I'm going to go ahead and let's do a Redshift render. And then I'm going to open up the BPR filters. I'm going to start bringing some of those passes back in. And we're going to start stacking these on to kind of combine the best of both worlds. So let's let this render. And then we'll pop over to the BPR filters for that. And so now, boop, we are rendered. Now I'm going to come through here. Actually, I'll turn this one off. I'll turn on the BPR filter number two. I'm going to come through and say, let's do a texture overlay. And then I'm going to pick that texture. I'm going to import it. And so let's say I want my, bring in my BPR AO pass. Now it's going to come in like this and you got to punch a little guy standing around, but that's okay because I'm actually going to take the texture overlay and I can drop that to, let's say zero. Boop. And that's going to bring that over. And now I can start playing with the blend modes if I would like. I can maybe set a different multiply and be crazy. I can set the screen. I can come through and start adjusting this and then also to adjust the overall opacity. Now, what you might notice is that when you start playing with BPRs with Redshift, once you're done with uh, the BPR and you want to see what it looks like overall, you then just re-render and then it applies the effect on top of the actual render. So these are ways you could come through and start stacking some of these on, getting a little bit more of what you would like to have. So, Yeah, there's a great question, Ian, <clears throat> about the um, global illumination, mm -hmm. um, about is there a way to turn it off? So we should probably show that because that'll... Speed up your renders if you don't want to take advantage of global illumination when you're experimenting. Um, 100%. It's a great way. I also like to use progressive buck rendering when I uh, am experimenting and drop the quality quite a bit so I can just even get renders faster. And on top of that, there is one thing I do want to highlight, the benefit for Redshift being inside a ZBrush. Some of you have been talking and been rendering having a lot of fun. I'm sure you may have noticed that your very first render takes the longest than any other render if you're messing with the model. And that's because we've done something special trying to speed up the render time, right? Because Redshift is its own program. We have to send the data to Redshift. So your first render is sending all the data information that includes the model, the millions of polygons, everything else like that. After that, if you got this model and you're still playing like Ian's been doing this whole time, we don't need to send the data again. So your render times are gonna get four times faster in some cases than your first render. So that's also important to understand is your first render sending everything. And then from that render out, as you're playing with the model, we don't need to send the model again. This is the benefit of also it being Redshift with inside a ZBrush. Yep. All right. So to turn off global illumination, it's really, really cool. So the, the primary GI is set to three and the secondary is set to two by default. If we want to turn off global illumination, Again, just kind of showcasing, I'll hit a render real quick just to see, boom, there's a global illumination. So all you need to do is go to the primary GI engine quality, turn that off and turn secondary off as well. So now when I hit render, it's just going to skip the global illumination pass altogether. And then it's just gonna, it's just gonna go through and process just the main render. So like Paul said, this is a very fast way to come through and start rendering quickly to get your results and see what you like. Of course, too, like, you know, emissive lighting, for example, that might change the look and feel of it if you have global illumination turned off. So especially with emissive. So when you're playing with those features, um, turn it back on and see which result you like uh, over the other. And so for me, I usually keep it at three and two because I just like the look and feel of it. But that's the way you can turn it off. Um, can you render multiple materials at the same time? 
uh, do you mean like, you know, my model has multiple materials and then I just apply that? Yes, absolutely. So, um, for example, if I understand the question correctly, I can say, yeah, let's make his head leather. So I, this is the same subtool. So I'm actually just going to come through and just say, like, yeah, let's fill that with leather. And then let's hide the rest because I have this uh, poly grouped out. And then let's say, like, okay, the rest of this, I want this to be um, a basic material. So I'm going to say, yeah, that's basic material. And then now I'm going to go ahead and feeling really, really good here, Paul. I'm feeling really, really good. I'm going to pick tinted glass for this bottom one. And then I'm going to go ahead and say fill that. So if this is what you mean by rendering multiple materials at the same time, yes. It's just each material now is just going to get looked at by Redshift. And then it's going to try to, you know, go through as it's rendering and then apply all the different effects. So, yeah, you don't have to render out individual materials for the look. You can have your subtool have tons of different um, uh, materials on there. And then it will render that accordingly. So right now I got my the clay one that we've been building, glass that was default, and then the default leather where you can start coming through and adjusting a lot of that. Ian, I think a question you should probably highlight the uh, shadow catcher and how you're getting a reflection on the floor and the shadows on the floor. That came up, and I think it'd be good to just show them how you did that from scratch. 100%. Great question. Great question. So there is so the, the there's two ways to go about getting a shadow catcher. The first way is tied to the floor that is shipped with ZBrush. So if you turn on the floor, there's usually like a flat color tied to that. So if I were to try to render this, and I'm going to just put everything back to a basic material, um, just so that render time goes a little bit faster and it's not looking at glass. So Redshift. Under the render menu, under Redshift Render, we have a material specifically for the floor. And it's usually shipped with a flat color. So if you have the floor turned on, it's going to render with that kind of base white color, as you could see here. So to get a shadow catcher, I'm going to cancel that out. Red, red, uh, Zebra ships with a Redshift basic shadow catcher material. So again, under render, uh, Redshift render, you just pick the shadow catcher. And then if I were to render this now, as long as the floor is turned on, it will render and then it'll start catching the shadows. This material can also be applied to any subtool within ZBrush. So you can bring in your own planes. You can bring in different random shapes and then atta attach a shadow catcher to them. And then all your other objects will cast a shadow on that material. But if you wanted it to be shiny, like how I was having it, what you could do now is select the shadow catcher material in your main material um, palette, just like you would before, and then go to your material menu, dock that, and then come down to modifiers. And then what I do first is I actually turn up the metalness because I think that just gives like a really nice shiny floor really, really fast. Um, and you can also uh, adjust the... Um, reflect color weights as well. But I start with the metalness, and then from there, when the material is selected here, even if it's not tied to a material, if it's tied to the floor like we had done before, so again, under render, it's right here. Because my material is selected, every update I do is going to affect the material on that subtool or in that um, in on that floor. So now if I were to do a render region real quick, just because I don't want to send the whole thing. I want to just sample it and see what I'm getting. I'll render region right by the floor. And now we can start to see a little bit of a sheen. And I can adjust this again. I can kick the metalness up. The roughness, I can now bring that down. And then I'm going to render region again. And with that shadow catcher now tied to that floor, it's going to go ahead and start factoring in that reflection. So now if I were to do a full render, because we could start to see a reflection, now at the bottom, you could see if that's kicking in. So it's a great simple way to go ahead and tie that uh, and get that sheen happening on the floor. And like I said, you can apply this. So if I turn the floor off and then hit render again, you'll now notice that we actually won't get that reflective background or that reflective floor because there's no material. Um, I mean, there's no uh, floor active in the viewport. So the material doesn't, doesn't take over. It's now base. But what we could do, is we could bring in a, let's say, plain 3D, just like we have here. I'm going to go ahead and 
drop that, kick that in, scale that bad boy up just like that. And then now with this, I could say, okay, I want to apply this material to this object. So I will go through and again, I can either say fill object under the color or under the poly paint with the material selected. And now if I were to go ahead and hit re-render, it's going to go ahead and now with those material settings on that plane, it's going to make that plane my new floor. So lots of different ways you can approach that. I really like using the floor default because what I can do as well is you might notice I'm getting a little bit of what looks to be clipping. And I would, that would just means that I need to expand the floor um, or the object. Here with the floor selected, I can actually come under draw and I can actually adjust the grid size to go further back, have more tiles as well. So now it's actually, um, it gives me that more infinite background look because there's more surface area of the floor to actually um, catch that shadow. Um, whereas, you know, you would just have to make your object or subtool a lot bigger in order to catch the shadow the rest of the way. So there are definitely ways to go about doing that, but that's how you would get that effect on your, on your floor in ZBrush. Yes, and it makes your object transparent. So it's just going to showcase the shadows or the reflections. So in a sense, yes. Yeah. Uh, to just make the object invisible render. Yep. So you'll notice that when I, let's turn this one back on. I'm going to turn the floor off. So I have this plane right here. You can see this is my plane geometry. It's invisible here. Let's actually just scale this up. Oops. Blow it up a little bit more. Let's back up here. Just want to make that bigger. Perfect. Make that bigger. Zoom in more. Yay. There we go. Now from here, I'm going to go ahead and hit render. And you'll see the shadow on the floor and the transparency. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the reflections, but you won't see the floor itself. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. All right. Saves me time doing stuff. Yes, nice. Very, very cool. Okay, great. So that that pretty much is starting to cover everything that I, I wanted to show to get everyone started with Redshift and uh, in ZBrush. So if you guys have any questions, definitely um, throw them up real quick. Uh, Paul, if there's anything else we wanted to cover. Yeah, the only one, um, buttons the monkey. Um, so like as I typed, uh, the dynamic subdiv, it's in essence is an update to L symmetry, local symmetry. So now you can rotate your model anywhere in space and keep symmetry. So it's a, a pretty, this is something a lot of you have been asking for for many years. You can reset also your symmetry plane line because it's dependent upon, the, it's using your gizmo in essence to set your symmetry. So there's two ways to do it. You can use Zmodeler or you can even use posable symmetry if you have geometry that is symmetrical on yep. the axis itself. Yep. And what I like to do, especially with the supply last action, so if you have a lot of things that are um, symmetrical from the beginning, you know, you're doing things in T-pose. So you have the jacket, the arm, the body, you have pants, everything is truly symmetrical right now. And you want to be able to have like a, a point to call back on any time. Wow, this light is super bright. Let's turn that, let's turn that one off. And turn this one back on. There we go. Um, what I like to do now, this is, again, another way to use that apply last action, <clears throat> is I like to go to my geometry stager, and I'll set my home stage, and then I'll come up to apply last action and have everything set at that home stage. So for things that need to stay truly symmetrical for a long time, but then you want to be able to work um, at, a, at a targeted stage, um, for example, let's send this off over here. Let's rotate the sphere. Let's do this. And now my spheres all over the place and i'm going to grab a um i'm going to grab my uh just a basic sculpting brush turn on local sim right now i'm sculpting on this symmetrically we then i can come back to my uh, geometry stager and set that target stage so at any point in time if i'm like man I, I i i don't know what i did but things are wonky now just switch back and then you can reset that gizmo I'll just clear that target stage and then reset it coming back over here. And then I can adjust and say, all right, now 
this is where I want my object to live. And then I can turn on that local symmetry and continue to work symmetrically off over time. So I always have a point that I can call back and reset things if things get, you know, if I'm the guy who gets everything out of control. So <laughs> hold on a second. I need a, I need to drink something. Let me talk in. All right. All right. All right. Thank you very much for the tips. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. So that's how I like to use it. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Yeah, that's one way. And then buttons the monkey. If you have more, I would say the best would be to make a ticket on our support. And that way you'll be able to communicate with us back and forth a lot uh, with one of us. So we can share things together as well. Yep. 100%. Help you through that. Yep. Very, very cool. All right. Well, again, that I hopefully that gets a lot of people started. Um, I know it's a lot of information. The stream is recorded, so it will go back up. And then again, I'm going to um, we're going to provide the ZPR today that's shown so that you guys can go through and, and try to follow along. We'll have that up as soon as possible. So check out, um, keep an eye because we'll we'll put the link like in the comment section or something so that you guys can go and grab it and you can start playing around. Um, but Thank you guys for showing up. This is a lot of fun. I love showcasing this new stuff. And Redshift and ZBrush has really just been a great tool to come in and start like playing around and getting my test renders done, getting things looking good, rendering high fidelity sculpts without having to worry about bouncing it around, being able to just kind of play and, and experience and express my artwork in this way. It's just a lot of the tools, everything that we've done with ZBrush 2023 has been to improve the pipeline, improve the workflow without changing the way you guys uh, work. So hopefully everybody's been able to dive into it. It's a lot of fun. And like Paul said, we're going to have now. So next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to have Shane Olson come on and he's going to talk about how he's been using Redshift and uh, ZBrush with his toy sculptures. And then we're going to have the following Wednesday, which is, what is that date? The first, we're going to have Mr. Paul Me. Gabriel coming back in and showcasing hard surface. So if you guys have hard surface questions and how Redshift integrates with that, pop into that one. And then on the 8th of February, uh, again, all 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to have Mike Thompson, who's a world-renowned sculptor and uh, illustrator. He's going to come in and showcase how he's been using Redshift and ZBrush. And then we have a uh, Nacho, who's coming in with jewelry and rendering and Redshift with jewelry, ZBrush. So a lot of really cool stuff. You're not going to want to miss it. It's just amazing content. So for the next five weeks, well, next four weeks now, <laughs> we're going to have a lot of information. Plus, we are going to be dropping a Getting Started in Redshift with Anna Carolina series coming out. So hopefully that'll be out soon. And then we'll be sharing that on our socials as well. So there's going to be tons of information. And like Paul said, you can always hit us up, ask us questions, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible in order to get you uh, in the right direction. So yeah, so thank you guys. It's been a lot of fun for me. I love, I love coming in here. What's the question? Paul, is that the same? Uh, <laughs> to be able to mm, you know, that's a great <laughs> question. Hold on, let me look. I don't think it is. I think this is a hat that was our first ever ZBrush hat. Um, I am. I, let me hold on. I'm, that's an I'm, important question. We got to answer it because uh, the beanie look. is at the Maxon store. The beanie's there. Which oh, you I love, love the beanie. Thing. And now there's I'm multiple a... different colored T-shirts now too. Yeah, I believe. Hold on, let me look. I think this is what they call the dad hat that's on the store. <laughs> so it, I don't know why they call it the dad hat. I don't know where that name. So it, it's form fitting to your head. Um, and the one I have is not doing that. I don't think. <laughs> no, I, I disagree. No, I don't think it's it the looks dad like hat. the dad hat from the image. So this Perfect. one is like this is like the very first one that we did a black and white cap. Well, if you guys like the beanie, <laughs> I will share a link to that store as well. You guys should definitely check that out there. Uh, super comfy, nice and warm. Uh, and I know there are parts of the world that are a lot colder than California. So <laughs> so definitely, if you need a beanie, it's very comfy. It's really, really good. I'm a spokesman for the beanie. It's just I have to have it. <laughs> 
All right. Perfect. Well, that being said, thank you again, everyone who's come in and watched and stuff like that. If you guys have any questions, feel free, especially if you're watching this after the stream or you come back and you're like, oh, I had a question I forgot. Comment in the comment section down below. We do see the comments. We do come through. And so we can always answer the question there. Um, but again, don't be afraid to reach out. And if you're rendering and, and sculpting in ZBrush and having a good time and you want to like Feel free to tag us with like hashtag made in ZBrush. Tag us on our socials. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. We're YouTube. We're everywhere. So you definitely can hit us up because we love to see your guys' work. So feel free to mention us. And that being said, we're going to call it. So everybody have a great, fantastic day. And we'll catch you next week. I'm excited. Shane Olson next week, guys. It's going to be awesome. Boo, boo, boo. <laughs> Sound effect at the end. Mandatory. Bye. Absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone.